All right. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for joining my ZBrush live stream today. My name is Eamon Akhtar. I'm a 3D artist in LA, and I have done a lot of 3D printing over the past few years. So I'm just going to leave this uh, image up. You can find out more about my work at Eamon3D.com. And I'm going to just make sure I can hear myself. And I'm going to just, yep, yeah, okay. Sorry for the double audio. Got to double check that I can hear everyone on Twitch. All right, so let me go into my usual spiel, and then we'll just jump right into today's uh, stream. So, yeah, like I said, you can learn more about me at aimin3d.com. A bunch of works up there. Uh, i got to make an announcement. Uh, I'm a teacher online at Mold3D Academy, and their registration for online classes just began two days ago. So if you want to learn everything I know about 3D printing, there's actually a self-paced option available for you where you can go down. Let's see. Not Mike's class. Mike's is Mason. No. Let's see. If you go into self-paced classes and look at 3D printing for ZBrush artists, so for 200 bucks you get eight weeks of lessons, assignments, and it teaches you the whole gambit of 3D printing for miniature scale, you know, jewelry, like basically slicing, keying, articulation, uh, all of it, costumes. So if you're interested in learning about 3D printing and using ZBrush to do it, uh, this is the class to check out, mold3dacademy.com, self-paced option. All right, um, moving right along. Uh, this is my Instagram, aimanukta3d. I couldn't get aimin 3 d because some dude grabbed it, and I think he's made like nine posts total, and it's private, but I can't get it. So it's Eamon Uchter 3D, that's my full name, A-K-H-T-A-R. And a couple more announcements. Uh, until March 31st, so that's three more days remaining, you can get $30 off a six-month subscription to ZBrush with this code, WWD7ZS6R. So if you're interested in trying out the best, in my opinion, digital sculpting application around, um, and some of the best customer service and you know good people. Uh, check out this code and you get thirty dollars off a six month subscription with it. Only until March thirty first. So if you're interested, jump on this. Uh, you can see this artwork uh, is something I made. Uh, it's based on the comic saga uh, by Image Comics, I believe. And God, how should I explain it? It's, it's basically about star-crossed lovers in space and. It's rendered with the new uh, non-photorealistic uh, features, non-photorealistic renders in ZBrush, I guess. So that's something to check out. And today I'll be showing, you know, I usually start my streams with a little bit of show and tell, and then we jump into uh, the stream. So for today, I'll show and tell a little bit about this awesome backpack that I made uh, to walk around and show off my fungosaurs at different events. This is kind of what it looked like last week when I put it into action uh, for the first time with uh, at GDC, uh, the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. So, as an artist, your your challenge is always finding uh, ways to show off your work, finding ways for people to see it, to interact with it, to interact with you. So, I thought this would be an excellent idea. Actually, it's my wife's idea. Uh, credit to my wife uh, Fa. She came up with uh, the thought that, hey, we should have a walking display. And so I found this uh, pet backpack, I guess you would call it. Uh, you can put cats in it and dogs in it from Westgate Pets. And then we just repurposed it to build a diorama around it. So I'll show that a little bit and, and some other show and tell, and then we can get cracking. Hmm. Double check. So I'm on the chat. So whether you're on twitch whether you're on YouTube or ZBrush live if you have any questions just shoot them in there and then I'll try to respond as soon as I can I'm gonna clarify messages from pixel logic are me Amen. alright what's up Shubramovin alright cool so if you guys have any questions just drop them in chat um, if you want to see previous videos that I've done, streams for ZBrush Live, they're all here at the pixelogic.com ZBrush Live presenters. Um, 
you can scroll down all these awesome artists and you can see some great streams and come down to Eamon Akhtar past broadcasts and schedules you can see what my schedule was for this month I'll probably keep this going throughout April like a weekly stream on Thursday mornings for me and here's a bunch of the previous streams so you can just go right through and check it out uh, just like through four pages of streams now which is exciting of being, being an official live streamer for ZBrush for a bit now alright great on the restream chat slack pretzel we got get some music covered alright sweet so it can play some music let's see what's going on here if at any point the music gets annoying let me know because this is my second time trying this uh, pretzel app it lets you use a uh, what do you call it uh, I guess free music to play during streams or just non licensed or something like that alright got a question already Shub, Shub remove and saying do you use any other rendering software or just ZBrush I use a lot of different software uh, depending on the needs uh, done some rendering in Maya started primarily with mental ray um, nowadays I do a lot of rendering in Keyshot, ZBrush and uh, Moto that's one of my favorite applications uh, that's actually where we're gonna start so if you look at the interface what you guys see on screen this is not ZBrush but Moto uh, because I wanna you know let's do a little show and tell first and then I'll come back to the pipeline stuff uh, and how I go about preparing my 3d print dioramas and stuff so first things first let me make this window a bit larger and uh, let's do a bit show and tell all right so what I wanted to show you guys first was this backpack so hold on let me do some stuff in here first unzip there's a light in there very important to have a little light click light kind of thing just adds a lot more uh, character to it and I guess first let me show you the complete feel with the lid on it's a little bit shiny and specularly so you may have a hard time seeing it but you can get an idea of what it's like while walking around I've got the flyers right here so it's very self-service people can just grab a flyer if I say grab a flyer got the uh, hashtag fungusaurus that's important uh, we didn't have that the first day and <laughs> we got really upset because so many people were taking photos they were like we need to put something on there so I just kind of quickly exacto knife cut it out of like you know sticker paper stuck it on but it's a pretty thick dome I can try to actually put it on and model it for you so you can see what it's like So basically from the side it's kind of it, it comes out a bit so you have uh, to be careful for where you walk but this is what it looks like when it's on me and you can imagine just walking around an expo floor stopping in various places uh, I think this is great for whenever you have a crowd gathered in any space even if you have an expo table I think it's useful to have another person your partner walking around with something like this because you get to tackle twice as many uh, people in the audience and you can redirect them towards your table or booth. So we'll be using this for San Diego Comic Con, uh, Monster Palooza. That's in a couple of weeks. So Monster Palooza is a big uh, expo for monster-related stuff, and so we're in the cute monster niche. So we'll be walking around with this thing, and then let me show you some close-ups. Oh, also, pretty much everything is glued down, so nothing should fall about in there. Except one character, I think, fell out. So I have to re glue him. But here's a closer look without any of the shine. And so these are the eight characters of uh, original fungusaurs that I made little dinosaur mushroom hybrids from RIP. Let me zoom in a bit closer. And I built this pretty much in a weekend, so 
I can explain really quickly how I went about it. Uh, this stuff at the bottom, the grass and in the background, that's just from a dollar store. Um, I think I have one here. Looks like this. So basically, it's just like netting with some fake plants on it. And you can kind of put it at the bottom of things, in the background of things, at the top of things. It just kind of sits in really well. Uh, what I ended up doing is I put some double-sided Velcro tape at the bottom and then I Velcroed it into the bag just so I can remove it if needed. All right. Whoop. Okay. So with that, basically, the base was Velcroed in place. And you can kind of see the Velcro if I lift this up. Uh, not really. All right. And I'm leaving it hanging off a little bit extra because when this backpack comes in, it's kind of perfect. Then this background piece, this whole thing, is from Petco. It's kind of like a terrarium, uh, what do you call it? Uh, just something for a terrarium or uh, aquarium. And it was basically a perfect fit into this backpack and had enough space for me to put all the characters. Ripped out some of the plants in order to make some more space. But yeah, that worked out perfectly. I drilled some holes into this thing and then tied it in place using ties. So I've got like one tie, two ties, there's two more at the bottom, so four ties, just so this doesn't fall out. And that was pretty much it. The rest was just taking my toys here, the fungus doors that I sculpted, and just hot gluing them on. But this diorama, I feel, was an incredible success. So this kind of thing, you know, is a great way to show off your work. Let me turn that off. One more close look, and then we'll move on. So if you come to any of the expos that I exhibit in, whether Lightbox, Designer Con, Monster Palooza, if you see me walking around San Diego Comic Con, I'll be the guy with the glowing backpack. Put it aside for a second. Anyone have any questions about the backpack or how I did it or anything like that? Let me open up this restream chat. <laughs> all right cool um, all right cool no questions about the backpack <laughs> just a lot of love uh, where did you get the dome backpack yeah the obvious question let me go ahead and show you guys that shrink this window back down Alright, so where I got the backpack is this place called Westgate Pets, uh, website I guess. Uh, I think it started off as a Kickstarter campaign, but they have a few different backpacks that are this kind of dome clear display shape backpacks. So these are perfect for showing off your work. <laughs> they have like a Pokemon looking one. That's fun. But I wanted the max, uh, you know, viewable area, not like a little dome. This may work better for some of your needs. Something like this. If you have a smaller printer, something to showcase. But basically, I think you can get these in a few different colors. And it's about 50 bucks US, maybe like slightly less if you find a discount code. But if you're interested in that, I'll drop it in the uh, comments. All right, cool. So then, back to uh, what we're doing today. So, the first step with any diorama is finding how you're going to show it, show the piece off. So in this case, a backpack. Um, what are you going to be putting the piece in? And how are you going to be transporting it? These are all key before you even start your project. So what I wanted to do is show you a bit of my workflow of how I figure out scale and ZBrush uh, in order to work on my projects. So uh, I'm in Moto here for us to begin. Uh, just because if you work in Moto, Cinema 4D, Max, Maya, it's easier to build uh, simple scale, uh, accurate scale things that you can then bring into ZBrush and build your scene scale around those. At least for me, that's been my workflow since ZBrush 2. 
So that's how I like to do it. So we'll start with first, let's just go pull up a new tab. And we're, we've got a Form 2 3D printer. That's the orange thing you see back there. And so first what I want to do is build a couple of build volume cubes so I know the scene size, scene scale uh, is going to be accurate. So when I export just as OBJ from ZBrush, it'll bring it in at the right scale. So the Form 2 build volume you can see here is 145 by 145 by 175 millimeter uh, or 5.7 inches by 6.9 inches. So almost 7 inches. So what I want to do in Moto here is go to just a primitive cube and I want to say you know set those dimensions so I'll zero out the position here and if we're doing let's see millimeter it's 145 millimeter by 145 millimeter by 175 millimeter all right you can see it automatically updated those in the centimeter but that's fine that's our cube All right, so this is the Form 2 build volume. Everything I print has to fit within there. What I mean by build volume is this is Preform, Form Labs print prep software, and that's it. You know, it's about seven inches tall by six inches wide, and that's the max amount of space that you can put into a print at a time. Now, prints can obviously be much bigger than this, but you know, you have to print them in separate pieces and put them together. So this is, it's important to know your build volume. So I'm going to take this uh, thing here, this cube that I've made, and let's export selected layers as an OBJ or an STL, it doesn't really matter which you pick. STL tends to have more native scale options than OBJ, so that might be better. But let's make a new folder here. Now, actually, you know what, I've got a folder I've been working in. Fungusaurus Base. I will call it Form 2 Build Volume 1. Alright, I'm just going to save this as 1 because we want to test it right away. It doesn't always work out as you expect. So I exported it out of Moto. I believe it was millimeters, but let's try it. So I'm going to go to the desktop, go to my Fungusaurus base, and there's the Build Volume. And let's just import that into Preform and see how it looks says it needs repairing I'm gonna ignore that but you can see it's small it's not the right scale so we want to make sure that this is the right scale even exporting out of Modo it's really about how it comes into uh, preform and you have the options of millimeters and inches inches is way too big we can see it's way larger than the build platform and the, honestly that's this is simply because of the weird millimeter, centimeter, uh, inches, export, import, uh, nonsense out of most software. So let's double, just let me show you something else also. This is Idea Maker. This is the software for my Raise 3D N2 Plus, which is a much larger build volume. No, it's hard to tell from here, from just uh, looking at a cube, but you're looking at 12 inches by 12 inches by 24 inches almost. So it's much larger than a Form 2 build volume. I'm going to import my model in here. Okay. And you can see, same as the Form 2, it's kind of brought it in as millimeters, uh, or just really, really small. So I'm going to go to scale and make sure I set it properly. So that's supposed to be 5.7 by 5.7 by 6.9 inches. Slightly less, 6.879. Let me update that, 6.9 inches. Rotate that as well, about 90 degrees. And that's the Form 2 build volume in relation to the Raise 3D N2 Plus volume. So I've got two printers, one smaller, one bigger. Um, you can see both here on my screen. This one's the Form 2, that one's the Raise 3D N2 Plus. And I want to figure out a couple of build volumes for both of these and bring those into my software. So now that I've got this scaled properly, I'm gonna export this out again. And we'll call it Form 2 Build Volume 2. 
me see if I can export not as STL but as Wavefront OBJ. All right, now let's try that one. We'll bring that in to preform. So there's an STL file and a Wavefront OBJ. You can try both. And here we go. So this time it fits in perfectly in the build volume. And so we know this is correct. At least for preform, this is correct. Let's toss that and bring in the STL so we can confirm the scale of that as well. And perfect again. All right, so at least as far as preforms concerned, this is an accurate scale. Let's do let's bring it into ZBrush and bring it back out. And I'll show you guys what I'm planning on working on. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the project that I'll be tackling today. What I want to do is build cut the range a little bit. Double the size of this. Anti-alias, drop it back on. So these are my plans for a uh, pitch maquette for the TV show I want to pitch for Fungusaurus, the IP that I'm building. Go ahead and fill In the subtool master. I'll go ahead and fill color and material so it'll all be unified. And basically what it is, is I want to build a little environment uh, that I can display my characters on. Uh, maybe even have the characters mounted in place already. Be able to take this to a pitch, plop it on the table, and be like, this is what I want to build. Uh, it's much better uh, in Hollywood to just have the thing you want to make really clear and made and obvious for people. So that they don't have to imagine it, you know, like you lose people in pitch process if you come in with a napkin sketch or a PowerPoint presentation or something. It's better to show them something physical. So this is the scene I'll be working on, but I want to be sure I'm building it at the right scale and I'm building it um, to fit. Um, so that's the first step is to make sure it fits within the transport case that I'll have. So for now, I'm going to simply import in that OBJ, the form to build volume. There's that. And what I want to do is export it out of here. Say build volume three. And this way I can be sure that just a one-to-one -one export out of ZBrush will open in preform properly. That means my ZBrush scale, scene scale will be correct. And there we go. So if this is coming exported out of ZBrush at the correct scene scale, that means anything I build in this scene scale will actually export out to the correct scale. So how does this work in you know practical workflow? I've got this scene here with my characters. Oh, that's an older one actually. Where's the newer one? Got so many scenes in here, it's hard to keep track sometimes. There it is. So what I want to do is bring in all of this stuff into my Form 2 build volume scene. So what I'm going to do first is just merge visible and it's going to create a new sub tool. Alright, music's a bit loud so I'm going to bring that down. Thank you for letting me know Six Syndicate. All right, somebody is calling me. Yeah, I know. I don't know how to turn that off in uh, Facebook. <laughs> when someone Facebook calls you. All right, cool. So now that I've merged the scene here, you know, I'm going to turn this music off. This, this soundtrack is particularly annoying. All right. So now that I've merged all of these things right here, 
I can append them onto my scene. And let's find out what scale we're working at. So right now we're working at a scale that will definitely print within the Form 2 build volume, but it's a really, really tiny scale. So this is not really our limiting factor. Uh, we can print on a raised 3D and 2 plus. So let's build the build volume of something like that. Go back to Moto. I'll delete this mesh because I don't need it anymore. And let's build another one. This time set to the build volume of a raised 3D. So we'll do the same thing we did earlier. Uh, we can look up raised 3D N2 plus build volume and that is 12 by 12 by 24 inches so 12 inches is about 30.48 centimeters so I'll write that in 30.48 24 is 60.96 and click apply. Looks like I need to add a mesh item first. And then click apply. There we go. Alright, so this is the build volume for a Race 3D N2 Plus. We'll do the same double checking in uh, exporting to make sure that it uh, comes out correctly. Call this raise 3D build volume one. Close out of moto. And let's bring it into Idea Maker. So again, super tiny, but it's not a concern because we're going to fix it. As long as it's at the right scale, that's what matters. Uh, right. Uh, dimensions that's what matters because we can adjust the scale 12 by 12 by 24 so there we go now we've got something that fits perfectly within the build volume for the race 3d I'm gonna export this out let's see race 3d build volume 2 that's the STL and export it out again as an OBJ back in ZBrush then let's bring that in and let's append that onto our existing scene with the form 2 build volume in there All right, so there's the working scene scale. There's the Form 2 build volume. And let's append in the Race 3D. So that's how big we can actually print. So most likely what I'll end up doing is I'll do the characters as multiple different Form 2 prints. Uh, and then I'll do the environment, the big thing, as a Race 3D print. And then just kind of mishmash. But this is kind of how I set up a scene from scratch. Um, I know what my build volumes are, I know what scene scale I'm working in, and I know um, how it's going to uh, just export. Like I don't need to mess with the 3D Print uh, Exporter, 3D Print Hub here, set any scene scale and export um, if I already am working at the correct scene scale. So we'll save this uh, as our start show pitch maquette let's call it two and this is actually not finished yet we want to do one more thing we want to figure out the dimensions of our transport case now you guys have seen the backpack and that was one example but what I want to do for this one is kind of a show pitch maquette so I want to be able to take it uh, into uh, a pitch meeting say on Netflix or anything else and then just put it on the table you know take it out of the box and put it you know on the table for everyone to view and get a kick out of so let me pull up this screen a bit bigger again 
and show you what I have in mind. All right, so this is the case that I've picked up for this pitch maquette, and I'll give you a sense of size in comparison with me. It's pretty big scale. Uh, it's not massive, uh, so it's not something I need to print really, really, really large. But it's it's good good for like taking to a pitch meeting. Like it's perfect to just carry in. It looks nice, shiny, and cool looking. I actually picked it up from a record store, uh, Amoeba Records. And the case is by ODY USA, uh, Odyssey Cases, basically, odysseycases.com. Um, just a cool looking case. Now, I've done pitch maquettes for much larger size, uh, and those you actually have to often roll. So you have to roll them up because they're, they're just so big, you know, you can't actually carry them around. But for my own pitch stuff, I wanted to be able to carry it around. Now, let's take a look at this case, what happens. So I'm going to pop this front lever latch thing. It's got a cool way of opening. And pop off the lid. And you'll notice the lid comes off. This is the space on the inside. And then there's a top. And you can see I already started putting foam into the top. So you want to have a layer of at least one to two inches of foam on all sides. And for foam, there's a couple of things you need to no. So this is your standard two inch foam. That's two inches thick. Comes in sheets like this. This is pretty cheap. You can get this for, you know, I don't know, five to ten bucks, maybe twenty bucks for something really big. Uh, but this is two inches and then, you know, it's great for transport because pretty much anything is not going to get damaged if you have a good amount of padding in here. So this is uh, kind of what I'll line the bottom or maybe some of the sides uh, of my case with. Uh, two inches is a lot so I might not want it on all sides. It really limits how much space I can have but maybe I will put it at least at the top or bottom. Now you don't want to have to cut, sit there and cut custom you know form around each of your pieces. That's where this stuff comes in. So if you take a closer look at what's happening here so this is all foam, but it's foam in which all of these pieces can come off. So I'll actually go ahead and bite the bullet and rip one of these off so you get an idea. This is called pick and pack foam. So you can actually remove little chunks of the foam and kind of conform it around any shape. So this kind of thing, slightly more expensive foam. Uh, because it's pre-cut in this really clean, nice way. But you can use this to kind of properly foam up everything. So let me think about this for a second. I'm going to remove all this pick and pack foam I've got in here. And I might just lie it down. So instead of using like full two inches uh, of foam this way you know and taking up a lot of space I'm gonna lie it down flat and that way it's only using about like slightly more than an inch and I have some more space to work with okay and I can make this even thinner if I want So I think the top should be a bit thick, but not, you know, so much that it's limiting. Mm -hmm. to, ah, I see. So what I'm doing here, kind of off screen that you guys can't see, is just removing all the chunks of foam that I don't want and just kind of fitting it in place. The ends may not be pre-cut, so you may need to actually grab a scissor for those.
okay. And the great thing about this foam is that if you have any gaps, you can just fill it in with something really tiny. Yeah, perfect. All right, so this is basically kind of like the top layer of my foam protection. And then the bottom of this thing, I'll just probably put the same amount. <coughs> now, you don't need pick and pack foam for filling out the top and bottom. What you need it for is around your character. Uh, or your maquette. So basically it's perfectly conformed into space. But that's what this stuff is really useful for. But now that we've got that figured out, I can build a build volume for this case. And then that will be my deciding factor for scene size is the build volume for this case minus the space that the foam takes up. So that's the first step I need to calculate, and then I can build my maquette around that. So hope this gives you kind of an insight into my working process, because when you're making things for real life, not only do you have to engineer them, you have to think about how you're going to transport them, how you're going to show them. All right, let's shrink this window back down. And let's see if you guys have any questions going. Okay, no questions there. Cool. And I think, thought I had Twitch open as well. Yeah, Twitch stream. All right, great. So then I shrunk the window down, but this part is really straightforward. I'm just going to take a ruler and measure this sh box out. So this is about 14 inches by 10 inches. So 14 by 10 is my uh, width area. So first let's actually build out the box. No, 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 cancel. Let me go back in moto. So 14 inches is, let's see, depth, let's do it in Z, 35.56 centimeters, 35.56. Oh, I see, it's doing it in millimeters, that's why it's not doing it right. Um, Okay, 10 inches, let's do that in the X, 25.4 centimeters. And then the height, if we're looking just at the case on its own. And give me a sec as I try to figure this out. So the height is about 13 inches. And 13 inches is 33.02 centimeters. Apply that. All right, and that's basically the dimensions of my case right there. Now, as I said before, we want to build something smaller than this. We want to account for foam uh, along the sides. So let's duplicate this mesh. Move it out of the way, just so we can get an idea. So if this is the actual case, what we want to build 
is within the build volume of something like this. That way we account for foam along the top sides and bottom and around. Now this is obviously just really quickly scaled and it's not accurate, but it gives me an idea of what the accurate scene scale would be. So let's start here. You can hear my corgi barking in the background. And let's actually do it right. Let's instead of just doing a quick vague scale, let's figure out how much foam I'll be putting on each of these ends. So basically if I'm putting like a couple of inches of foam on either, you know, the top or the bottom of the sides. We should figure out that build volume and then build the scene within that scale. So I'm trying to do some math and figure this out as I go. And that's what I'll import into ZBrush and build my scene around. Alright, so... There we go. If it's 13 by 14 by 10 then what I'm working with is like 11 by 12 by 8. So that's kind of like a conservative uh, 2 inch border around everything and I may actually you know make it larger than that uh, but this will be kind of our starting point so I'll basically have both ready. So I'll add a new mesh Go into my cube. Eleven by twelve by eight. That's the eight then. That's the eleven. Twenty seven point nine four centimeters. Thirty point forty eight centimeters, twenty point thirty two centimeters, and let's apply that. All right, so that's basically what I wanted to show you. Even if you're thinking that you're going to buy a case that's this big, you know, once you add the foam and protection that's your build volume, it kind of shrinks down. So I'll call this case volume 1 and we'll call this that we export foam case volume one same workflow I'll kinda of bring it into idea maker double check that the scene scale is correct and then I'll export it out there's the case volume Let's go back to scale double check it in inches uniform scaling the largest axis is 14 inches 14 by 13 by 10 that's correct we'll export that out so that's basically my build volume for this case This is the boring part when you're just figuring out the scene scales and whatnot, but it's important to take this step and do it. Case volume two. Okay. Then let's do that with the other piece, which is the foam volume.
And this one is, let's see, 12 inches is at its largest. It's 12 by 11 by 8. Yep. That's basically the volume with foam. So actually pretty big still. And I can tell that that's going to give me plenty of space to work with for my, uh, at least the thing that I'm building. All right. Export that out. I'll call it foam case volume. And it's just a habit for me doing things in both uh, STL and uh, wave and uh, OBJ, double checking everything. All right, now we can go back to ZBrush, and let's bring those in. Uh, it's form and foam actually are pretty close together, so I want to make sure I grab the right one. All right, let's append. All right, so now let's go over kind of what we've got here in ZBrush. So there's the show pitch maquette. And this is kind of my working scene scale. And I like working small because Dynamesh works better for me and I get to make large changes by having my brush be really, really big. So I can make my brush any size I want and move you know, large swaths at a time. So I can do stuff like this which would be hard to do if I was working at a mega scene scale. The Form 2 build volume is my minimum scale for the characters and just anything I would be working in, that's the minimum scale. The Raise 3D build volume, that's the max scale of my Raise 3D. But what matters is really these two. This is my case, and this is the case with foam applied on, slightly smaller. So at the end of the day, this is the volume that I need to worry about working in. So let's go to my maquette there. And you can do this using the transpose tools or the de deformation tools. But basically, I'm just going to scale it up. And sometimes faster if you just use the deformation tools. Now this, you know, directly impacts the design, how I'm planning to get this thing done. So before I go too deep into the design stage, I want to make sure that I can actually make it. Now already I'm noticing the back of this is just, it's like a volcano. I bu I'm building this off of a volcano model file that uh, my friend Jake Kemper made and gave me as a starting point. And that's just too much negative space in the back. I don't need that space. So I can simply, you know, move it back into place. But that's my character scene scale and how I've got basically this thing set up. Now I can go even taller so that's good to know so instead of focusing on building um, horizontally and depth wise too wide I can make this whole thing taller which means the characters can probably get bigger all 
Alright, so before I start moving all these things, pieces around, I want to make sure I get my characters off onto their own layers. And I can get slightly bigger than that too. That's my max build volume within the case. So I might try to even buy myself some more space than the foam case volume will allow. Just so that way it'll be packed in really nice and secure. <laughs> Got some more comments on Twitch. Eddie6699 saying, you do 3D prints. I know you. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> and then Cryptid88 saying, watch the How to Train Your Dragon printing video with my son and saw you on it. They were really cool. No, they were absolutely, they were fantastic. Um, it was a really fun project I got to work on with BuzzFeed and How to Train Your Dragon, uh, making three giant 15-inch 3D prints for them, uh, sculpted by myself, my friend Daniel de Leon, um, Christopher Dean, and uh, I'm blanking on her name, Alyssa Lesnar, uh, all awesome modelers that I got to pull together into this project and sculpt three dragons and print them out within less than three weeks. For anyone that's interested, I can show you that, at least link to that. Uh, you can actually just type in Dream Dragons on YouTube, and it comes up. That's the first video. You know how in sharks you it's where we surprise these kids by bringing their, you know, dragons that they visualize to life. So this part, you can see me doing some sculpting and printing and talking about uh, the process. And then Kim, the painter for DC, actually painted them. And then they would do the reveal to the kids. So yeah, I'll drop that video in here for you in the chat. Thanks, Cryptid. Idiot. Glad you liked it. All right. Um, yeah, for the dragon's job, actually, I did a very similar workflow to this. I figured out a 15-inch build volume. I actually figured out my uh, various Form 2 build volumes that I could stack next to each other, and then that's what I build my dragons around. So that's kind of a very important stage for 3D printing, is to make sure your seam scale is accurate and you can build something properly. All right, so what I want to do right now, there's a lot of different groups here. So there's all the groups for the environment, and then there's the characters. Let's see, it looks like the characters can all be on the same group, so it might be the easiest to just select them and hide a bunch of them. There we go, perfect. So now that the characters are isolated on their own layer, I can split unmasked points. Oh no, split hidden. And the environment is on its own layer. I'm using these characters that I got from uh, my time working at HeroForge.com, uh, the Sky Castle Studios, as placeholders. So I can think about like fun poses and different accessories uh, and just kind of build from that point. I'll probably end up completely re-sculpting these from scratch. But... first thing I want to do is just work on my environment figure out how big I can make it and how Let's see take a big brush start moving pushing and pulling these pieces around Make this whole thing a bit taller. 
it's good to have uh, different eye levels or different heights for your pieces. The more a character is at eye level, and so if you have it on a table, just like on the table, it's below eye level, people don't care. But if you raise the eye level, it's, it's at their level, so they'll care more. At least they'll take a better look. So I'm just basically going around the sides, massaging these rocks into place, thinking about my Maxine scale. And I'm not too concerned just yet with uh, the look of the rocks. That's secondary. So the back is going to be kind of just a sheer cliff face, and I'm fine with that. As long as there's some detail. Now I don't want to take this all the way up to the top because I want to leave some room for the character. And you want the character silhouette to break the silhouette of the background. But it might be good to have some of the back edges of the cliff a bit taller than the front edges. Are you guys getting excited for the new uh, Avengers coming out soon? I know I started watching uh, the movies again. So just finished Age of Ultron and Infinity War. Man, Age of Ultron is good. I can't believe I hadn't watched it a second time. <laughs> Galash Cannon is like, nope, not really interested. <laughs> Teach their own, I guess, for sure. So many movies, so much content these days. But it's a good time to be a content creator. From everyone that I've spoken to, uh, this, there's just so many streaming channels and networks and different people looking for content. So, one thing I learned early in my career is if you're not working on your own dream, someone else will hire you to work on their dream. So it's worth it to, you know, spend some time and figure it out, figure out what your voice is. What is it that you want to show, that you want to do? Alright, so I'm taking a look at this, and I've got a space for a character there, 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 and here. And I want to make sure, like right now, these two spaces are too level. So I want this space to get a bit higher. It's all about uh, different uh, levels, you know? And I think having a simple rock wall it's kind of boring. Uh, I want to be able to add some water feature, maybe like a tree. Just something more interesting. Maybe I'll add a waterfall going down the center here. Serheka says good words. Thank you. appreciate that. It's tough being an entrepreneur, but it's important to think outside of the grind of just the regular production schedule and just being a producer uh, no being a production artist I should say producer is something very different because I've been a production artist for about a decade uh, in advertising games uh, VFX commercials animation 
And at a certain point, you start thinking about, well, what if I was actually trying to get my own voice out there? Uh, what is it that I want to say, the stories that only I can tell? And really, it's not so self-centered. It's more, uh, you know, making these kinds of things. It's always a team project. But it's about assembling the kind of team you want to put together and kind of making the projects you want to make. So I'm just working in transparency mode here, trying to figure out the shape of this thing a bit better. And then I can come into these characters and scale them around as well. Start by just scaling all of them up a bit larger. I think they can all be larger than they are right now. Maybe that's too big. I can mass select as well and move only one at a time. Yeah, the kind of show I want to build is definitely kind of like a kids action adventure explorer genre. I feel like I don't see any of that anymore. And it's about uh, these kids uh, not buying the narrative that uh, fungusaurs are dangerous and uh, abominations and they want to actually go see for themselves. Alright, so I'm imagining there's like a water feature running through here, right down the center. And then I've got four different platforms for these four characters. And then I'll have my fungusaurs kind of laid out on the table in front here. So, I don't know. That's the first iteration of this anyways. <laughs> Lori Bender, BC, saying I'd watch that and I'm not a kid. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of uh, important. I, I don't want to create a show that's geared only to like, you know, three to seven year olds. I want to make something that's like six to twelve age range but that adults can appreciate. Alright cool so now you can see uh, the one character's head is kind of slightly higher than uh, the foam build volume but I'm not concerned about that because I know that I still have some wiggle room with my case volume being much larger. But when you're making physical, practical things, it's all about uh, understanding those relationships, understanding how something's going to be real. Well, if you're interested more in my show, I'll be uh, hopefully launching an Artella campaign soon. We'll see how I can you know, wrangle that. But uh, the plan is to kind of get most of the script written out and storyboards and kind of a pitch bible built out by September in time for the Lightbox Animation Expo. So if you're around in LA uh, during that time uh, in September then you can come and get a first hand look at uh, what I'm putting together. Alright so now I've got these characters in place I can now resculpt the environment a little bit again to think about uh, you know to accommodate these characters. Also move some of them around a bit more. That one could be a bit further forward. It's all about looking at it from multiple sides and making sure that this would look good from any angle. I mean, I'll most likely be sitting behind, so I'm not too worried about my view. 
uh, but it's about other people in front. This should be angled up a little bit, kind of like Pride Rock. Hope some of you understood that reference is from Lion King. Pride Rock is the uh, place where uh, Mufasa and Simba and their family live. If you watch one of my earlier streams, uh, I did like a cosplay mask of Scar, the lion, the villain from Lion King. So part of me is not sure. I kind of like this girl uh, character up on top. Uh, she's supposed to be kind of the climber character, but it may be better to show her kind of off to the side, actually climbing the cliff. So holding on to the side of the cliff rather than, you know, just already at the top. So I don't know. I'll we'll have to see how I uh, end up changing these characters. I do like the interplay... Uh, just different ideas about different uh, relationships these characters can have. And this character kind of having a... Uh, whoop. He's kind of like the archaeontologist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, archaeontologist is fitting because he's an archaeologist and paleontologist. Uh, he's got a little, like, you know, gerbil or rat or something. Uh, meanwhile, this one's got a hawk or a falcon. <laughs> We'll see about the animal companions. It's just a first draft idea. I'm thinking about this water feature idea that I had and how it, it, the water might actually flow. I'm going to switch to the damn standard tool. Just kind of try to sculpt right through there a bit. Imagine it. So kind of like a waterfall running between. Not a thick one, but like a thin one at least so you know that these characters can still kind of jump around it. Like a little stream. I'm curious as to what everyone else is working on because this is kind of my own uh, IP that I'm building but I'm wondering what everyone else is up to. Are you guys sculpting for work or are you guys and gals obviously just hanging out? Any cool projects that you're working on for yourself? Any contest? I'm all about personal projects. Contest not so much anymore. I used to do a lot more of those earlier in my career. Now I'm just like, now nah, if you don't pay me, I'm not really <laughs> interested in doing free work for anyone.
And that's what I feel contests end up being a lot of the time. It's just kind of an excuse for companies to get free work. I should host a contest. <laughs> With rocks, you want to kind of emphasize the, the sharpness and a bit of unevenness. You can't have uh, very even rocks. I may end up doing kind of a noisemaker thing on these later, so I just want to focus on the big, large shapes right now. <laughs> we got Peter Staff on here saying just sculpted a croissant for a scene. That's the best. Another thing I want to think about and have uh, worked out right away is that the bottom of this ground is going to be flat. Don't want any surprises there. And finally get it printed and it's all bowed out or something. So part of me wants to make the characters kind of mounted in here for good, but another part of me likes the idea of being able to take them off uh, and kind of show them in hand. So the flatter I can make these spaces that they're going to be standing on, the better because then I can just kind of plop them on and plop them off. So my challenge is to make that flat space kind of not seem so... Uh, boring. Switch to my clip curve brush because right now you can tell the bottom is kind of all over the place and kind of bumpy and I want to basically flatten it out. Taking some time to think. We've got 13.4 million polys in this scene, so it's a pretty heavy uh, rock. But there you can see it's kind of all flattened now. I might actually end up losing some of these uh, offshoots in the back. They're not really adding anything. But this is kind of like the planning phase, and I'm kind of happy with how it's turning out already. I'm going to go in and save the scene. Let's see. Maybe append something like a sphere up at the top. That'll be just the scene, scene name. ZBrush always kind of renames the top Z tool to be whatever you save it as if you're working as Z tools. Might be better to save documents entirely, though. Laurie Bender saying, will this be a hollow rock? Yes, for sure. There's no way I'm going to uh, use a lot of material for this rock. Uh, I'll likely print it in FDM and then uh, do some resin coating on top to kind of smooth it out and then give it some texture. So like that rock isn't really serving any purpose for me in the back. 
So I'm going to switch over to my select lasso tool. And then just take that piece right off. Same some of these other back pieces. Not too concerned with the back of the sculpture. It's all about the front. It's all about the front and sides and how it's going to be displayed. Sometimes when you clip, it kind of gives you a really flat, thin edge around everything, and you want to delete those. I know how to feel about this rock. kind of like it, but also kind of unnecessary, unnecessarily sticking out. I might rotate it around a bit. All right, that should be good at least to delete those side rocks, maybe this one too. Geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. I don't really need that big one either. Delete hidden again. Cool. All right, so now what I want to do is dynamesh this rock so it's kind of one piece. Right now it's made up of lots of little polys and just different pieces, and it's 13 million, so that's, that's way too high. the save scene again. Sometimes Dynamesh for something this heavy can crash it. Um, likely you guys will stop here listening to my audio uh, while this happens because it'll likely hang for a little bit. But yeah, let's try Dynameshing. I'll try the default 128 resolution or let's try something really small like 8 first. All right, so we can tell that a resolution of 8 is way too tiny. It's just 1,500. So let's crank that up to 128, and now let's see. All right, still a bit light. But this is how I like to dynamesh, is just work my way up in resolution. Let's try 500 this time. All right, that's done too, looks like. And that is 1.6 million. So that's pretty much all I need for this. It gives me the resolution that I wanted. I can still sculpt it, but I reduced the file by, I don't know, the model by many, many, many millions. Rocks or, you know, this kind of thing. It's all about adding uh, unevenness, asymmetry. So it's usually, you know, pretty organic shapes until you then go in and crease them up.
and make sure these ledges are big enough for the characters to be on. Kind of go, go in and flatten some of these as well. All right. So I want to think a bit about the switch gears and think about these characters and their poses and what they're up to. So these were all built, like I said, in HeroForge.com, but they're kind of placeholders. And I want to, uh, I don't know, make this um, as dynamic as I can make it. So i got to think about it still. I don't like how low this character is in the screen space because I feel like it's uh, likely going to... Uh, just be not viewed because it's going to be all the way at table height. So I might want to raise all of these characters. This is the point where you figure that stuff out. So I'm going to save this as 3 now. And think about what if I did actually move some of these pieces around. So what if she's up here somewhere? Hmm. Hard to say. And what if I do actually have this one? kind of off to the side of the mountain, kind of climbing the mountain. Tells a better story than if it was just, uh, you know, just kind of posing at the top. And if I do that, then I can grab this one and move him up to the ledge up here. This one's kind of like a crocodile hunter, kind of inspired tracker, Australian uh, kid. <laughs> I'm probably going to lose that apple in his hand and just have him point. That's the direction we're headed. And if she's up there, then I can lower this one a little bit. And this kind of makes me rethink uh, the shape of the whole uh, piece. A part of me likes this idea better because it's just more dynamic. If it's an action-adventure show, might as well show some action-adventure in the maquette with this uh, climber character kind of actually climbing and holding on to the side. Did you guys see uh, the Free Solo movie that just came out recently uh, with Alex Honnold? Let's see.
All right, got a question in here from Eddie6699 on Twitch. Uh, is something like this 3D printable? And so this is the image that they've sent. Um, yeah, that's totally printable. Uh, there's a base. There's uh, Everything seems pretty well interconnected. I may have uh, this arm and this skull and maybe even this arm uh, separated. So the, and maybe the wings too, kind of keyed off, and then you assemble it later. Another question here, let's see. Are you normally working in isometric view? Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, um, so I don't turn on perspective until I absolutely have to, um, because it's important for me to think about it, you know, in terms of engineering first. Uh, will this stuff fit in? And so that's the first step, is to just think about it like that. But later, yeah, sure, I'll turn on perspective and get a sense of how this is actually going to look. First, you got to figure out the important engineering stuff. All right, now that I don't need this ledge, and this whole ledge can be lowered, I think it should look a lot better. This one can kind of scale back. It'll kind of feel more like a step ladder. Cool. So I got the climber character, got the tracker, got the paleontologist slash archaeologist. I think I call it paleo. No, archaeontologist is what I said earlier. <laughs> I'm looking forward to actually doing a writing retreat and just writing this stuff out, thinking about story. Got to buy some time though. It's tax season, so I got to focus on that first. And then get around to everything else. All right, now that I move some of these pieces around, I feel like that water feature that I was thinking about can be a lot bigger. So I don't know. Still something to think about. Might as well expand it this way and kind of have that water go off to the side. So I like this side of the cliff and I think it'll be fun to show her climbing on it. But I don't know if I like this side. Just the sheer drop off is a bit much. So maybe I'll have it filled in along the back a bit more. So it gives me the ledge for the character to stand on, but not like so sheer. All right, you know what I'll do is I'll actually bring in, say, a curved tube snap. That'll be kind of the starting point for my water. Well, 
popped out of edit mode for a second there. Just thinking about kind of a stream coming down like a waterfall along this edge. Switch over to Snake Hook Brush. Turn on Sculptors Pro Mode. Kind of make some tributaries going from that stream off into other places. I like the idea of there being kind of a splash over here too. Or lots of splashes along the way. That's fun. I'm going to switch all of this to a skin shade. Let's see, skin shade 04. And let's do some basic coloring in as well. So I'll go to my Subtool Master, <coughs> Fill Color and Material. Now these two were masks, so I didn't work on those. Make that stream kind of bluish. Make these rocks kind of, I don't know, red rockish. And the characters I'll just think about later. <laughs> I think I should pop these off onto their own layers so it'll be easier to edit them individually. Now I can go to this one. Let's think about his pose. This kid on Pride Rock doesn't need that campfire there anymore. And I think I'll change up his hand as well. Come to think of it, I think I had an IMM brush with different types of hands, but I don't know where it is anymore. There's body parts. No, I know I had like a hands brush at some point. I think I had grabbed it from... Uh, Bad King. I don't see it on here anymore. Either way, this is bugging me. So I'm going to toss that. Whoop. Too far.
And we'll kind of add a hand in there for pointing and that's the direction we're going. Now this girl in perspective mode, it's hard to tell that she's not facing the right way. So I want to rotate her around. Maybe too much. Or maybe not enough. Let's see. Nope. Too much. Needs to be more subtle. I like that now. You know, a little bit of change in flow and direction. You get to see a bit better what's happening. Whoop. So I like her flow and her direction. I just want to change up... Uh, her face, the way she's, she's, her face should be looking more forward. Alright, the climber, I don't know, this pose just isn't going to work at all. Uh, if she's on the side of a cliff, so I'll just need to rebuild a bunch of that. But what I can do for now, kind of rotate her in place, move her in place. Kind of imagine it. See if I do an auto groups, what's happening? I can hide some of these pieces. No. Hide a bunch of these. And it's uh, hard to think about uh, the falcon in her hand now. Because, I mean, she's climbing, so kind of changes things. Oh, that's interesting. Didn't even see that. <clears throat> Going to hide this campfire now. This base. Yeah, I think I'll do that for all of them. Hide all the bases. I do like the cute little mushrooms shapes on here though. Might keep those. And I do like the ground that's happening here. That might be a useful texture. I did this at Hero Forge for a little bit, posing all these uh, different rats and ground creatures, companions and all. Look at that. Still an IMM curve in here from when I drew the curved tube snap. Just drop that.
Let's make sure I've got this river kind of flowing back from something. I sculpt in some flow for that water. And let's inflate up the splashing over here so it actually feels more like splashing. We got my Sculptors Pro on, so it might uh, lose some detail here and there. It's fun to do some environment sculpting because I mostly do characters nowadays. Fun to change it up. Let's do a snake hook again. That way we can kind of pull at ease. Uh oh. Too much. Sean Lake on here. What's up, man? Good to see you, brother. Thanks for joining the stream. I always like it when a kind of a tributary or a river flows back into itself somehow. We've got this much water flowing, we'll need some greenery as well. So I'll need to think about that. Now thinking about 3D printing, I want to make sure that whatever water I end up making is sculpted and part of on the cliff itself. Creating some bubbles here for the water to actually bubble around.
And then you get to get to the fun stuff after you've handled all the scaling and the figuring it out. This kind of sculpted will. So Sean's asking, was this sculpt I'm working on? This is going to be one of the, or maybe the pitch maquette that I do for my Fungus Source TV show, or animated show that I want to pitch. So I'm going to try to get this ready by September. Still a ways away from there, but I'll probably keep thinking about it and reinventing it and rebuilding it. So wanted to get it started. Let you guys in on the process and see how it's done. Yeah, so I'll probably add some greenery to this, properly change up the poses, and you'll see me hit this a few more times, likely, in my streams. Let's turn on perspective again. I'm going to select these little shrooms here that are all over the place and make sure they are properly in the ground. And I can just sculpt the ground to meet them too. No set rules when you're sculpting water, just try to make it feel like it's flowing from one piece into the next, just more organically. Want everyone kind of leaning forward because it's there's there needs to be forward momentum. Everyone needs to be kind of going together. Now this guy too, maybe I'll have him lean forward despite the fact that the model's not built like that. It's all about context. Uh-oh. 
Darn. Crashed it. Not surprising. Hopefully ZBrush saved something, but that kind of stuff happens when you give it too much to think about. In the meanwhile, let's answer some questions. Peter stuff was asking how much does it cost to 3D print a model? Uh, it really depends, honestly, on what you're uh, doing. Like size and scale matter uh, tremendously and complexity. Also, material. Uh, Sean Lake's asking what's going to be the scale of this completed model. Well, Sean, it's going to be about 13 inches by like 14 inches. Uh, by 11 inches, I believe. That's kind of what we decided upon. All right, let's see. The recovered tool is basically just a sphere, so that's not going to work. Uh, let's open up the last save. That may be a little while ago, unfortunately. Yikes, that's quite a while ago, isn't it? Yeah, we kind of lost all the water feature and the fun stuff we were doing. Let's see, maybe recovered a document. Nah, lost a bunch. That's okay, I'll get back to it uh, after stream and then continue on. But uh, that's pretty much all the time I've got for the stream today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining, uh, despite the fact that we lost a little bit. I think uh, you guys get the idea of what I'm working towards and uh, where it's going to head. So if you want to see more, uh, join next time at, uh, I believe it'll be, well, if you're interested, it'll be updated here for my April schedule at pixelogic.com, ZBrush Live, uh, Amy Nuckter. And you can catch a copy of all my previous streams on here as well. As before, if you want to follow me, I'm aimanuckter 3 d on Instagram. And my own work is on aimant 3 dcom if you want to take a closer look at all the stuff I'm about. Uh, lastly, uh, Mold3D Academy registration is open again, so 3D printing for ZBrush artists. Uh, $200, you get eight weeks worth of lessons on all sorts of 3D printing. So if you want to know everything I know, that's the class to take. All right, so right here, thanks all for joining my stream. I spelled joining with the H. Until next time. All right, see you later. Bye.